Several months ago, we had water damage here at the QTH where my gear was located. The XYL said to me, why don't we move your ham shack into that underutilized walk-in closet? It's bigger than our daughter's first bedroom in our first house. Who am I to argue with my wife? Here we are three months and a lot of dollars later, and we want to share with you what we've accomplished. I'll take you through the steps of how to go from this to this. We'll rip holes in perfectly good drywall because I love to spackle. Who am I kidding? No one likes to spackle. We'll add new electrical circuits for the current needs and future expansion. We'll bury a new ground rod and bond to the existing QTH electrical system. We'll take perfectly good new ham gear and what do we hams do? Well, we modify it to the specific needs of the application. And what would you do if you went out and bought a brand new $300 tool chest? That's right, your first thought, like mine, take a grinder to it. Why yes, yes that is smoke coming from inside that tool chest. Throughout this series, I'll share my experiences at my QTH in my setup. We'll cover the mundane from what is a ham shack. We'll answer the question whether or not we need to upgrade our electrical system. We'll cover bonding and grounding. And then we'll talk about how do we get our antennas from outsider home to insider home? Do I want my shack gear to be permanent or portable? How do I have a setup that can do both? How much space will I need? What about noise and thinking about the future? Many questions will come up during this series regarding grounding and bonding, and I'm going to refer you to the subject matter expert, this document produced by ARRL. While I may describe some of the things in this manual that I apply to my use case scenario, I'm going to strongly recommend, based on all the different codes in the various localities, states, regions, etc., as well as differences in your construction, that you grab this book and you use it as your reference manual in making decisions for your shack. Whether you're expert or beginner, I hope you find something useful in this video series. Some of you may be unimpressed by my ultra organized external utility box wherein all my feed lines are highly organized, as well as my switches for my UHF VHF antennas in the attic antenna farm, my HF antennas in the attic antenna farm, as well as backyard portable, and then my switch that lets me go HF rig to HF rig here in the shack with whatever antenna I wanna operate on. Others of you, especially newer hams, may be intimidated by all of this. Let me say, this is unnecessary to get on ham radio and become effective in making contacts. This is a journey. And the level to which you become more complicated or sophisticated is totally up to your desire, your budget, and your space. But you don't need all of this. Right now, we're going to cover the size of the ham shack and make some suggestions where to locate it at the QTH. This, my friend, is a ham shack. By definition, a ham shack is a place where radio equipment is located for receiving and transmission on the ham bands. And while this is a rather unsophisticated and simple ham shack, by definition, it is such. And if this is all you have, and this is your starting point, my friend, you have a ham shack. And regardless of your opinion of the humble Baofeng UV5R, this is a good place for many people to start. It's how I started in ham radio, and I say that unashamedly. If you're like me and that humble beginning turns into an obsession, you're quickly going to want more. And perhaps the next logical step in a ham shack is to upgrade to digital. Here is a digital HT. It still does everything that the UV5R does on an analog basis, but now it introduces the ability to talk worldwide. So in this tiny little space with a radio and a hotspot, or if you have a local repeater that is digital, you don't need the hotspot. And all of a sudden you are talking not just locally, but globally using digital modes. You still have a very reasonable, rational, cost-effective, confined space that is your ham shack. Many people who get bit by this bug just keep going and going, and your limitations are really time, space, budget, and your interest in the hobby. But my point is this, it can be as simple or as complex as you choose for it to be. Let's change directions now and start talking about some recommendations for where to locate your shack at the QTH. 
I'm now going to refer you back to the grounding and bonding manual from ARRL. As you look at grounding your ham shack and bonding to your house electrical system, you have to understand local building codes to make sure you're in compliance, as well as the best way to do this based off of this manual. So what I'm speaking to here are general considerations. This is not specific application for your use case until you confirm it with your information about your house, your local building codes, and your particular setup. Homes in the United States of America come with this wonderful square or rectangular metal box on the side or the front of the home with a glass globe that allows a person to come by one time per month and take a look at what's been going on, how much electricity has been consumed. And then there's usually some rather thick diameter conduit that goes down into the ground and then a large electric cable that's running to the utility provider that provides us and brings us our electricity. This also normally has some type of ground rod associated with it. And so somewhere in here, there'll be a separate wire that will go down to the ground and it will attach to a ground rod. And that ground rod, at least by code here where I live, must be completely underground and must be eight feet long, solid copper or copper clad. The recommendation for locating a ham radio shack would be somewhere um, so that you could take and put a rectangle or square box somewhere else close by that electric utility. And this box would be for the purpose of bringing your feed lines into your home. And you've seen that box earlier in the video. In my particular case, from here, I have conduit that then goes up to my attic space because most of my antennas are in my attic antenna farm. I do have a couple of antennas that I can run backyard portable that I can also feed into this particular box. Associated with this box would also be a ground wire. And that ground wire, let's just stick with, uh, well, let's go red here for this ground wire over here. It's going to connect to a plate in this utility box and it is going to go down to the ground. And then guess what? There's going to be a separate ground rod for grounding of the shack. And so here is another completely uh, below ground level, eight foot ground rod. So the reason that I would recommend locating your ham shack utility box close to the electric utility is because of what's known as bonding. Bonding is taking and connecting these two together. Let's not lose sight of the fact that not everybody has the ideal set of circumstances for the location of their shack, and there might be compromises that you have to make. I'm giving general ideas and direction. You're going to have to adjust to your particular situation. The first thing that I would recommend in locating your ham shack would be this. Let's stay away from internal walls as much as possible. Um, I mean, here, this would be a great example. I have no idea why you would want to put your ham shack in the kitchen. I don't think that you're going to be allowed to, you know, locate it right here on this wall or maybe this wall here. But as soon as you go into an internal wall, where are you going to run your cables? I suppose that if you were going to set up your shack here in the dining room, you could run a chase across the bottom of the floor and go through your exterior wall and then you could put your utility box on the outside of this wall. Let's think a little bit more practical for a home. And more ideal situation would be to find a bedroom that has a spare closet. And fortunately, in my case, although this drawing doesn't do a very good job of showing bedrooms because there's not even a closet here, let's go ahead and pretend that there is a walk-in closet here in this bedroom. My shack is located in a repurposed walk-in closet that's five times the size of my prior shack. I'm thrilled about being in the walk-in closet. And if you can end up putting your shack here inside this walk-in closet, there's my desk. Now you have an exterior wall in which you can go through 
and locate your box here external for your cables. And then perhaps, if luck is on your side, the electric utility box is over here, and here's that magic window that they look in to see what type of electricity, how much electricity that you have used. And then you'll have a ground rod over here for electrical, you'll have a ground rod here for shack, and you can bond these together. There are distance requirements for that bonding. Again, I'll refer you back to the manual. I know what some of you just did. You stepped away and you plugged in the Sawzall battery to get it fully charged. Or you're asking yourself, how much does a demolition hammer cost to get through that concrete block wall? Well, I did go through concrete block stucco and I can't wait to show you that episode. Others perhaps are a little bit weak need. You didn't think about having to break through the wall of your house or get into the attic space. And don't worry, when we come to that episode in this series, I'll show you some alternatives that are not quite that difficult intrusive or destructive to your home. But next up in the series, we'll talk about electricity, how to know if you have enough current coming into that room and how to distribute it properly across all the equipment you need to run. Hope you found this useful friend. Talk to you soon. 73.